So good afternoon, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to Inside Talc. My name is Colleen Lett, and I work here on the marketing team at Talc. I want to thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to join our lecture on Southern Italy, one of Talc's favorite destinations. For those of you who are joining Inside Talc for the very first time, it's wonderful to have you with us. And for those of you who are returning, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Inside Talc is a new platform that we've created in our 95th year to connect with one another until we can travel again. It's a way for us to share with you the world's great destinations, cultural sites, and expert knowledge from our partners around the world, such as Claudio Molo. We hope today provides you with some insights on one of our favorite destinations, the Campania region, and provides some inspiration for a future journey, which we're all longing for when the time is right. Uh, before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that I'd like to cover for everyone. First of all, um, you'll see that everybody is on mute. So if you have questions or feedback during the lecture, please post them in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. We will hopefully have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation and we'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible. If we do not get to be in, at the end of the session, Claudio and I will take time to write back to each of you individually via email. Also, you will see during the presentation that we have live closed captioning provided. You do have the option to toggle this on or off via show or hide subtitles at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Today's lecture uh, should last anywhere between 45 minutes and one hour. It will be recorded, and like all of our Inside Talk events, it will be shared on our blog, The Talker, and in our newsletter, The Compass, in the coming weeks. So today, as you all know, we have the good fortune of being joined by Claudio Molo from Italy, who is a very esteemed partner of Tauks. Claudio is a scholar of ancient civilizations and a specialist in archeology, span art history, and philosophy. He has extensive experience in the Campania region of Naples and Southern Italy, having worked in tourism for 60 years, 50 of which he served as an official archeological guide. Claudio is a true connoisseur who dedicates his time and scholastic pursuits to studying what he says interests him most, the origins of man, mythology, the history of religion, and scientific research. He recently authored a book called In Quest for the Seed Idea. Claudio's relationship goes back several decades. Indeed, he is one of our most valued and trusted partners around the world. He is the founder of Syrian Tours, which is a Sorrento-based family-owned travel company, which has worked with Tauk for decades in sharing Capri, the Amalfi Coast, the city of Naples, and the sites such as Pompeii and Herculaneum with our treasured guests. In 2014, he was the recipient of the Tauk Honors Award, which is a special recognition we share with our partners who exhibit extraordinary care and superb service, a passion for travel, who are committed to sharing the very best of the destinations they know with the world. And he helped create several of our Italy journeys with us. And indeed, um, over the past several decades has inspired us to see Italy in new and exciting ways. I have no doubt that today's lecture will do the very same for you. And so now let us travel back to ancient times to the eighth century AD and learn from the man who knows this region best, our friend Claudio Molo. Good afternoon. I'm very happy with this experience, which gives me the opportunity to talk about Pompeii after so many months. Pompeii is the result of a series of historical and natural coincidences. One, built on the slopes of a volcano that for many centuries remained dormant. This meant that local tribes had no memories of eruptions. Two, Pompeii was located near the river Sarno and uh, the sea. In the center of the Bay of Naples, uh, fertile land and incredible natural beauty. Three, on the border of the uh, two civilizations, uh, the Greek people coming from south and the Etruscans coming from center north. Four, Pompeii was buried and not destroyed as it is often written. That's why it's the only complete city of the ancient world with its original private and public buildings, roads, 
fortified walls, monumental cemeteries, road network, temples, and artefacts. What concerns the beginning of the history of Pompeii, there are archaeological evidences dating back to the 6th century BC, 2,600 years ago. But to have Pompeii as a Roman municipality under all civil aspects, we have to wait until the 1st century BC. In this period, many Romans, politicians and wealthy entrepreneurs, fascinated by the beauty of the Bay of Naples, began to buy lands and build incredible residential palaces on the peninsula of Sorrento along the Amalfi coast in Herculaneum and Naples. The economic boom happened in the very beginning of the first century AD, when the first emperor decided to spend mostly of the time in palaces in Capri, on the Isle of Capri. The Isle of Capri actually, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, one of the most uh, beautiful islands that we have in southern Italy. It's like a fortress, it's surrounded by cliffs. So the emperors chose the island as a fortress. They were looking for safety. And uh, the first emperor that lived on the island was Caesar Augustus Octavian, then Tiberius, and then Caligula, and so on. So this brought in the Bay of Naples many politicians, many wealthy people, and uh, we had actually as a primary economy here uh, the production of excellent wine, olive oil, and garum. The garum was a sort of a source paste obtained by fermenting uh, the entrails of blue fish, adding olive oil, vinegar, and aromatic herbs, like uh, the Worcestershire sauce, more or less. It was a cosmopolitan city in the Bay of Naples. We can say that uh, in the Bay of Naples, uh, there was uh, uh, La Dolce Vita uh, of the Empire, even though Roma was the capital, but the emperors were living here and enjoying life here. In Pompeii, you could meet businessmen coming from all over the Mediterranean Sea. The number of inhabitants who lived and worked in Pompeii during the first century AD has been estimated in about 20,000, between freedmen, slaves, foreigners, and Roman citizens. To better focus the importance of this number, imagine that while in Pompeii we had 20,000 inhabitants, the city of Paris, the French city of Paris, was a village of 8,000 people only. But now let's start with the, the presentation of the city. Here we have the first slide, ladies and gentlemen, where uh, you can see uh, Pompeii today the Vesuvius mountain in perspective, and here on the right as it was. Okay, so the distance from Mount Vesuvius to Pompeii is actually something like seven and a half miles. In those days, the mountain had a different shape, was a a peak of 6,000 feet, okay? And the, the city was very close to the sea. Today, Pompeii is something like uh, one and a half mile far away from the sea. But in those days, only 350 yards from the sea. The town actually was buried by a tremendous eruption. All of a sudden, this mountain here in the background, called Monte Somma, exploded. And uh, it, it was a, an eruption very similar to the one of Mount San Helens in the state of Washington. The Vesuvius is a stratovolcano. It's a, 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 an explosive volcano. So the first 
warning, the first actually sign of the disaster happened in the 62 AD. In 62 AD, while the CD was going on really in a fantastic way with the great economy at the beginning of the empire, we had a tremendous earthquake that almost uh, destroyed the entire region. Estimated to be uh, the sixth scale degree, Richter scale actually. So after the earthquake of the 62, the historians told us that uh, the entire region was abandoned by at least the 50% of the inhabitants. So if the population of Pompeii was of 20,000 people after the earthquake of the 62, we had only 5,000 people, uh, only 10,000 people living there. So those uh, that decided to remain in Pompeii, they started to rebuild the city using the latest technique of reconstruction. And that is the, the brick and the, the silica cement. While all this reconstruction was going on, ladies and gentlemen, we had the explosion of the mountain. It was the year 79 AD, the 24th of October, 79 AD. While the Pompeians were building and restoring the city, the mountain here exploded. So you can see the missing part of the mountain that was going up to 6,000 feet. This is the missing part of the Mount Summa. At the end of the explosion of three days and three nights of eruption, we had the, a sort of a concentric crater, the large one of the first explosion, and then the smaller one in the center of a one and a half kilometer of circumference. So was born the Vesuvius crater here on the left hand side. Soon after this explosion, we pass to the next slide, we had the first phase of eruption. Imagine that uh, the pressure from the magma chamber of the volcano shot to the height of 15 miles, the volcanic material, the volcanic debris. You can see it here on this picture, the volcanic ash, cinders, white hot pumice stone were shot to the height of 15 miles. This volcanic material started to travel in the direction of Pompeii almost within a few minutes due to the northwest breeze that we had in those hours. The eruption started at 1 p.m. of October 24, 79. And soon after that, we had the, the rain of volcanic ash and cinders that started to fall over the roofs of the building of Pompeii. People really thought that this was the end of the world. Such a disaster. Imagine that in Pompeii, as a witness, we found a fabulous inscription in a house of somebody that must have been of Jewish culture. He wrote, Sodoma and Gomorrah again. So this man compared actually the rain of fire over the city of Pompeii to the one of Sodoma and Gomorrah, the biblical town. Well, then after that, we had uh, this rain of volcanic ash and cinders on the roof of the houses uh, for at least five, six, seven hours. From one o'clock, to 6 p.m., the tremendous amount of volcanic material accumulated on the houses of Pompeii made the, the roofs of the house collapse. So in the first phase, Pompeii was buried by 13 feet of volcanic ash and cinders up to the second floor. So the city was buried first. Then in the second phase, it started at about uh, 11 o'clock of the same day in the night. The jet of volcanic material that you see here, due to the decreasing power from the magma chamber, 
actually it fell on the slopes, creating surges of pyroclastic lava flow that you can see here. Imagine this material falling from that height of 15 miles on the slopes. The first surge came in the direction of Pompeii, and Pompeii was at only eight miles, as I was saying, from the mountain. Reached Pompeii within a few minutes. So the city of Pompeii was buried by pyroclastic lava, white hot gases brought in the direction of Pompeii, and the entire city was buried within a few hours. At the end of the eruption of three days and three nights, Pompeii lied under 22 feet of volcanic material in total. So we had two directions, as you can see, eight different surges of volcanic material, of pyroclastic lava flow. One went in the direction of Pompeii, southeast, and the other one went down southwest to Herculaneum. Herculaneum is closer to the crater, only uh, four miles, four or five miles. While in Pompeii, we had something like seven, eight miles of a distance. So at the end of the eruption, imagine that the entire area was a, a lunar landscape, a lunar scenery, three days and three nights. By the 27th of October, the eruption was over. Now we have <clears throat> we have so many information about the time that the eruption started and all the details of uh, the volcanic material traveling <clears throat> in the direction of Pompeii and in the direction of Herculaneum. <clears throat> Excuse me. Many of this information were given to us by uh, the nephew of Pliny the Elder. You see here on the map, ladies and gentlemen, the word Misenus, Misenus and the Bay of Pozzuoli, right here next to Naples. Well, in those days, 79 AD, we had the, the Roman Navy fleet military fleet stationing in this bay, over 300 boats under the command of uh, the Commodore Pliny the Elder, of which you can see the portrait here on the left. Pliny the Elder was not only the, the commander of the Navy station here in the Bay of Naples that was patrolling the western border of the empire. He was as well a man of science. And as soon as he saw from Misenus this huge cloud having the shape of an umbrella pine, this is the description given to us by Pliny the Younger, he immediately started to travel with his uh, flagship from Misenus to Pompeii. He wanted to see closer this phenomenon, this eruption. He was so much interested in being a man of science. So he started to travel in Pompeii. Imagine that he covered the distance of uh, something like 17 miles with only two hours. So he started to travel from Misenus, as you can see written here on the map, in the direction of Pompeii. And then at a certain point, due to the rain of volcanic ash and cinders, he had to divert to the city of Stabia, which is at the very beginning of the peninsula of Sorek. So he, once over there, he gave order to his crew to sail back to Mycenaeus, and he was hosted in the house of one of his good friends that was living in the residential town of Stabia, next to Pompeii, five miles southeast of Pompeii, uh, the house of Pomponius, this was the name of his friend. And once over there, uh, they started to suffer breathing the gases that were raining over the area. In fact, it's recorded that Pliny the Elder passed away in the morning of the second day of eruption in the house of Pomponius, right here in Stabia. 
And uh, this report of what happened in the Bay of Naples in those hours, written by his nephew that became a senator, and he wrote the report to the Roman Senate 25 years later. In these letters, we could read actually uh, what Pliny the Elder did at uh, what time the eruption started, okay, and how long the eruption lasted, three days and three nights, and how many were the cities that were buried in the area. Let's go to the next, <clears throat> to the next uh, slide. Here we have, uh, I wanted to show you this map because this map was uh, really amazing. It was found in Germany. It's a copy of an original map of the first century AD, ladies and gentlemen. Because one of the questions that often <clears throat> visitors of Pompeii are making is how come it took so long to excavate Pompeii from the first century AD when the city was buried <clears throat> until the 16th, 18th century when they started to dig it up. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the point is that uh, we had a lot left written about the Roman cities in the world, but no geographical map showing us the exact location of these places. In fact, you can see the confusion we can see the confusion of this map. This is the peninsula of Italy. This is the Adriatic Sea. This is the Dalmatian coast. And imagine here on the opposite side of the Bay of Naples, there is the north coast of Africa, Tunisia. So it's impossible to find out where Pompeii actually was located. We can read the name of the city, as you can see it over here, Herculaneum, Naples, Oplontis, Pompeii, and Sorrento, where we are now. Okay, then we can see the range of the Apennines, the backbone of Italy mountains, the, the river Volturno and the river Sarno, because Pompeii was built nearby a river. So the Romans, they have built really uh, miles and miles of roads. And we're talking about 80,000 miles of roads built in the world. You have to know that the max expansion of the Roman Empire was uh, under Adrian, 117 AD. We're talking about uh, 50 different countries under one system, the Roman wall. And here on the right, I have reported one of the Roman roads. Something quite interesting is the chariot wheel mark of the wagons on this road, as you can see. In Pompeii, we had no drainage underneath the roads. So the roads themselves were the drainage. And uh, especially during the rainy days, these roads were so dirty, so muddy, so that people could not walk on the roads. So we have the stepping stones, as you can see, this boy is jumping on the stone uh, from a side to another of the road in order to walk on a dry and clean place. But we still have the chariot will mark out the wagons. Well, wherever we have measured the distance in between the chariot will mark out the wagons, it seems that the Romans were adopting the standard gauge system, four feet, seven and a half inches. In fact, we can see here, it's a two-way road. One chariot here on the left and another one on the right. Then we have stepping stones to allow the chariot wheels of the wagons to go in between the stones themselves. Something interesting is that when in England, in some of the areas where there are a lot of Roman roads in Great Britain, they had to build the, the railroad. They simply placed the rail on the chariot wheel mark of the wagons. And that's why the English railroad has the same gauge of the English, uh, the, of the Roman uh, cars. I believe that the United States has only 
uh, an inch of difference, four feet eight and a half inches. So this is the reason why we could not find the city of Pompeii, even though a lot was left written. So what really happened in the area? We have to. We had so many problems uh, since the moment that Pompeii was buried in 79 A.D. until it was brought to light in 1860. We had so many problems. 1800 years, ladies and gentlemen, we went through the fall of the Roman Empire, the invasion of the barbarians. Uh, so many foreigners domination we had here, starting from the Swabians, the Norman, the French, the Spaniards. So we had so many revolutions and then a lot of disaster, like uh, plagues, uh, like uh, famines, revolution, and then the First World War, and then the Second World War, and then the many earthquakes. Very, very often, I mean, they had to stop digging and exploring the area. This is one of the reasons it took so long to dig it out. Here uh, I have uh, pictures uh, showing us the digging of the 17th, 18th century. Everything was done by hand. So very expensive system, a lot of people involved. And so it's totally different as it was up to nowadays where we have professional uh, archaeologists and people restoring painting, as you can see these two over here. While the archaeologists here on the right hand side, and this is quite interesting, I believe, as I told you, we had two phases of eruption. During the first phase, the first 13 feet of volcanic material from the ground floor of the house, the second floor, we can see it over here. I see this archaeologist is pointing the border of the two different material, the two different faces. First, the cinders, the pumice stone, the debris, the volcanic debris. And then after we had the pyroclastic lava on the top, as you can see it over here. Okay, 13 feet, and then the remaining one up to 22. So two different phases of eruption. So three days and three nights of eruption and a tremendous amount of volcanic material bearing the entire place. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of, one of the questions that we often had while visiting Pompeii is that what they have done with all the material excavated from Pompeii? Well, this material, which is volcanic material, rich of potassium, very rich soil, they have used it to reclaim the Sarno Valley, because next to Pompeii there was a river, the Sarno River, and the, the valley, an extensive valley in between the range of the Apennines to the peninsula of Sorrento, an incredible, beautiful valley at the bottom, the southeast uh, area of Mount Vesuvius volcano. Well, they have reclaimed this place, which is an extremely rich area, very, very fertile. I have to add another thing that uh, nearby Pompeii, there, was, uh, there were other villages, other cities. So Pompeii was not the only one that was buried by the eruption of the 79 AD, but we had as well, the city of Herculaneum, that was a city of 5,000 people that was buried too. It was the city of Oplontis uh, that was buried too. Moregine, Moregine was right on the river Sarno with a, a great organization of docks for cargo ships. Uh, for cargo ship. And then further down, we had the Stabia, the city of Stabia residential area. So, we had quite a few cities surrounding the town of Pompeii as far as Sorrento. Then we had Terzino and other cities. So it was not the only city that was buried. How come and how they found Pompeii? Well, it seems that they were digging for an aqueduct. And while digging, they found the remains of a temple, the temple of Zeus Melikios. But imagine, these people were not professional archaeologists. We were under the kingdom 
of the Bourbons. The Bourbons was the, one of the last uh, uh, kingdom that we had here in Naples. There were half Austrians and half Spaniards that were dominating, uh, dominating the southern part of Italy. The capital was Naples and the king was in Naples, Charles III. He started to explore the area, but they were digging like moles, digging tunnels going down to the city and other tunnels going around the city, taking, taking out uh, uh, as much as they could, but making a lot of disaster too. To have the proper digging, professional archeologists, we have to wait the unification of Italy. Italy was unified in 1860. So only at that point, a professional archaeologist, his name Giuseppe Fiorelli, he started to dig it out on a proper way. He said, let's bring to the light first the city walls. Once we know the circumference of the town, we know exactly how large is the area within the city walls, which is 164 acres, 66 hectares. So this area was divided in nine regions, and they started to take the volcanic material away, region by region. But as I told, as I showed you on the first, and I like to show it to you again on the first slide. Here we are. Since the 1860s. We brought to light only the three fourth of the entire city. One fourth of Pompeii is still buried, as you can see here, here, and here. Okay, let's go on. While digging, actually, with so many interesting. Surprise. Well, uh, you have to know, ladies and gentlemen, that archaeology means uh, revelation. The archaeology is a science that reveals to us our history. Okay? And uh, so it's so interesting while digging, while you take the volcanic material away, uh, what you Seed that was left of there 2000 years ago. And uh, behind the single subject and the, behind the single object, there is the history of somebody that uh, was suffering during those hours of eruption. These people really, they must have seen something tremendous, something apocalyptic, really a cataclysm. One of uh, the solution that uh, the archaeologist Fiorelli found was to obtain the plaster cast of buried people, as you can see here on this slide. For instance, you see, when you, they dig in Pompeii and they take away the volcanic ash, all of a sudden they used to find cavities. Cavities that were left by the decomposition of buried bodies. So the archaeologist Fiorelli had a great idea. While digging, he used to knock the ground. While knocking the ground, as soon as he heard the, the hollow sound, the echo of a cavity under, he immediately stopped digging. And he started to drill the ground, as you can see it here, drilling the ground from the open air down to the cavity as you can see it over here, because this man here was buried by volcanic ash, as you can see it over here. This volcanic ash became so compact around the body and made the cast of the position of buried people. So during the following months, we have the decomposition of the body. So the body, while decomposing, left the cavity around the skeleton, still there that did not decompose. So this was replaced by, actually, as you can see, this plaster. As you can see, the archaeologist is pouring plaster through the holes in the cavity. The plaster replaced the decomposed part of the body around the skeleton. 
once it was complete and filled in, they've been waiting a week, 10 days, the plaster became so hard and solid that taking the volcanic material away, we brought to light the same position of buried people. In the plaster, there is still the original skeleton. We call this plaster cast. Not only the plaster cast of men, as you can see over here, of a boy here on the left, but as well the plaster cast of an animal. In this case, a dog. This dog could not run away from the CD because it was chained, so burned alive. That's why his body was found all twisted. Furthermore, taking a skeleton with the modern science, they've been able to reconstruct the aspect of a Pompeian, as you can see here on your right hand side. It's a forensic reconstruction of a Pompeian face. And then we start to visit the house, ladies and gentlemen. There is an incredible number of houses, talking about over 12,000 rooms that were actually dug out in the city of Pompeii. You see, to visit the entire city of Pompeii, uh, probably you need, uh, I would say, two weeks uh, going there every day for four hours each day. Uh, we found so many houses and so many interesting buildings of which I can show you the picture of some of them. For instance, this house here is the house of Menander. Menander was named Menander because we found a, a painting in the house that you can see here on the right on which you can see sitting the famous Greek poet Menander reading a poem. We found his name written here on the dress on the right hand side. In this fabulous house that was rebuilt soon after the earthquake of the 62. That's why the house is in a such great state of preservation. Because after the earthquake of the 62, this wealthy man that used to own this house, so he started to rebuild the house, repaint the house, restore the house with the latest technique of reconstruction, brick and silica cement. That's why at the moment that uh, we had the eruption, the house was one of the strongest houses in town, still with the original painting, as you can see. Well, in this house, we found another treasure, 118 dining items in silver that are now in exhibition in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. And here on the left as well, a bed that has been restored clearly with wood, but gives you an idea of what the Roman bed looked like in those days. So this is the house of Menander, but in Pompeii, as I said, there are so many houses. One of the most famous is the house of the Betty, the house of the phone of the dancing phone but not only houses in Pompeii, we have as well interesting public buildings. And here we are. After the earthquake, people that were willing to remain in Pompeii because they wanted to stay over there, they had reinvested, okay, to rebuild the buildings. First, what they have done, they have rebuilt all the bakery stores. And this is quite obvious. If you want to stay in a place, you need nourishment. So they first have rebuilt all the bakeries. In fact, all the bakeries of Pompeii are built with brick, as you can see on this slide. The brick in Pompeii, as in Herculaneum, and as in Stabia, in Oplontis, it's reconstruction after the earthquake of the 62. So wherever you see the brick, you cannot make a mistake. It's a reconstruction after the earthquake. Here we have the oven. And these are the grinders. Okay. Through the top part here, there are two different slabs of lava stone. The lower one is conical, and the upper one is biconical and concave. So the cereals, the grain, was actually poured through the top cavity passing in between the surfaces of contact of the two stones was grinded and collected around the base as a flower. 
So these are grinders. And here we have the oven. Then in the oven, so Pompeii welding, we found often bread love, as you can see over here. Okay. In one of them, we even found the stamp of the bakery store. These bread loaf were found in the ovens. You can imagine that as soon as the eruption started, the bakers, they were not waiting for the bread to be baked to save their life. They left everything where it was and they went away. So the bread, we found it a bit overcooked, but still there in the, in the ovens. Another interesting building is this one. It's the large theater. The large theater of Pompeii. And here in the background, you see this portico. This portico is so large, okay? There are over 120 rooms all around here because it's made of two different floors. These are the gladiators' barracks where all the gladiators were kept in. And uh, this is the area that where they were trained to combat. In Pompeii, we found an amphitheater for 20,000 people. So one of the largest amphitheaters in southern Italy was found in Pompeii, in a great state of preservation. After the gladiators' barracks, we have the theater. The theater, here we have the Imacavia, which is uh, the VIP area, a section for the VIP people that were sitting here. They were the only people who could sit on a proper couch, on a proper sofa, to sit sofa, right here, Ima Cavia. Then we have the Media Cavia, where the majority of people were sitting, then the Summa Cavia on the upper part. On the left and on the right hand side of the stage, as you can see, there are balconies. These balconies were for the sponsor of the show. Mostly of the shows in Pompeii, as in any Roman theater, were sponsored by people, politicians often, okay, so for electoral propaganda purposes. Here we have the stage made of uh, wooden timber, as you can see over here, and the postsinium made of brick, as you can see. Here we have a sort of mausoleum, a tomb that was found outside the city walls of Pompeii, where this man was so proud of having a biselia. This was the sofa seats in the theater that was over here, that even sculpted it on his tomb. So the biselia was a, a social conquest, we can say. And then we go to the painting. A lot of entertainments were going around the city of Pompeii. You have to imagine that in Pompeii, in general, we found uh, probably over 30 in between brothels and VIP erotic clubs, private. Okay, so, so many erotic pictures and painting and porno literature. You can see here, for instance, the initiation of this young lady on the left hand side. She's trying to find shelter on the matron's lap. Here we found uh, this painting in the house of uh, the chaste lover. This is the scene of uh, a party of the Roman times. You see this man is enjoying drinks in between these two ladies. And here on the right hand side, we have a thermoporium, which is a sort of snack bar, refreshment pub. During the day, it was more a fast food place, but during the night, it was a place where people were going to enjoy life. You can see the counter here, still the original one made of marble, eight different terracotta containers in the counter for a different uh, type of soup or even drink. Okay, and that the shrine here on the back, sorry, the shrine here on the back is this one that I have reported down below, 
is the shrine that is actually a sort of temple where the pater familia, the owner of the place, symbolically represented here in the center with the horn of plenty in his left arm, is making with the right hand a small sacrifice, okay, in honor of Mercury, most probably, which is this deity, this god here walking on the left hand side. He has a, a caduceus scepter in his left hand and a bag of valuable in his right. Okay, so they were making daily sacrifices, you know, for wealthiness of the place. And there are two slaves dancing and pouring wine. And here on the right, we have the god of wine, Bacchus. Underneath, we have two horned vipers toward the center, symbol of eternity. So a thermopolium, in Pompeii, we found over 100 thermopoliums, were fast food places, whereas a taberna was a restaurant. Fast food places during the day, in the nighttime, were great pubs with any kind of entertainment, even game of chance. Even though the game of chance were forbidden, but still, they, in Pompeii, they found a way to skip this. In fact, in Pompeii, uh, it's recorded that they had a lot of problems of people uh, in the night time that were often killed for money problems. So uh, in Pompeii, we found, for instance, loaded dice in some of the gambling rooms. So Thermopolium is a refreshment point during the day and a tower during the night. Beside the tavern that we have seen, the houses, the theater, the bakery stores that still we can see in a great state of preservation in Pompeii, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most beautiful places are the public terme. The public terme that you can see over here. This is, for instance, the terme del foro of Pompeii, where we have different rooms. Okay? There is a, the first room is called the apoditerium, which is a sort of waiting room and undressing room. Once they are ready to enter the tepidarium, they could come in this room over here. You see, all decorated with this elegant stucco on the ceiling, white and blue. The people could deposit their belongings in these lockers which are still there, the original one, supported by this miniature of statues, the Telemans. So the single visitors of the public terme could deposit their belongings in these lockers. And after that, they could sit on these original bronze benches, one, two, and three, around this rectangular brazier, a sort of fireplace. So people were sitting all around this brazier to improve, increase the temperature before going into the room for hot bath. So the itinerary was, first exercises in the gymnasium of the terme, then apoditerium, undressing, tepidarium, here increasing the temperature and then going through this door into the calidarium, which is the room in which we still have the original marble bathtub, okay, with hot water where people could lie in a pleasant hot water. And after that, they could run into the frigidarium that I have reported right here, so a shock of temperature from the hot bath into the cold bath, which is this one over here. See, there is a, a water tub from the wall over here into this circular marble basin where men could bath. Underneath the floor of the tepidarium and the calidarium, often, we found a double floor that I have reported here down below on the right hand side. It's called the Suspensura 
heating system. It used to work like this, ladies and gentlemen. When heated the room of the calidarium, there was an oven producing hot air. The hot air is to circulate through the double floor that you can see over here and from the double floor into the double walls. This to make it pleasant actually for people with bare feet walking on the floor. So they were walking on a pleasant world floor. Not only, but they could actually stand nearby a warm wall. This great system was invented by an architect here in the, in the Bay of Naples. His name was Sergio Zorata, uh, over 2,000 years ago. So this is actually the term, one of the many term that we have in Pompeii. We have uh, four term in Pompeii, besides another one that was found outside the city walls. This is not the biggest term that we have in the Roman world. Imagine that uh, in Roma, was, were found that the largest uh, baths ever built, uh, the one of Trajan, very similar to the one of Caracalla. One of Caracalla were a city within a city. I mean, you could stay in the baths of Caracalla for a week because in that baths, um, that was a city within a city. As I was saying, we have restaurants, library, a theater. <laughs> there was everything in there. Uh, there were brothels, of course, and so on. Besides this, in the general side, this term, we have uh, temples as well. Uh, the Roman civilization, uh, they had so many deities. Uh, they have copied entirely the mythological system of the Greek people. But the only god that never changed the name because Jupiter, Zeus became Jupiter in Roman world, as uh, Hera became Juno, and so on. But Apollo never changed his name. Uh, Apollo in Greek, Apollo in Etruscan, Apollo in Roman. He was uh, actually here with Pompeii, we have the Temple of Apollo. As you can see, the staircase going up to the cella, and here the statue in bronze of Apollo. Uh, he was the sun god the god of life, the god of energy. Uh, in fact, in the temple of Apollo, we found a column, and at the top of the column, we have uh, a sundial. This is the way that the Romans were calculating the day hours. A marble sundial with a needle in the center. Uh, hours were calculating, were calculated from seven o'clock in the morning, which was the first hour and then going on until six in the afternoon, the 12th hour. So the sun moving from east to west was moving the shade here on the lines of the sundials, and they could calculate the day hours. That's why we could understand as well, uh, I mean, when the eruption of Pompeii started, because in the reports to the Roman Senate, it was written that the eruption started during the seventh hour, and uh, this was about one o'clock. Then I like to repeat, after six hours, volcanic material accumulated on the roofs, made the roofs collapse. The city of Pompeii was buried. And then during the second phase of eruption, the surges of a pyroclastic lava flow completed to bury the city of Pompeii, in total 22 feet. After this, we have a lot of decoration in Pompeii, and the most beautiful <coughs> decoration, excuse me, are the mosaics, as you can see over here. We have still the original decoration made with the seashells of the Bay of Naples. This is the house of the large fountain. This man had in his garden this great dome, as you can see it over here with a very colorful tiles, marble tiles and glassy paste tiles. Beside the decoration of the shells and the mosaic tiles, the single tiles, ladies and gentlemen, are called tessere in Greek, square. Okay? Okay. 
And here we have a waterfall. See, this is a, a waterfall. This is a water tub on the steps, making a waterfall in the basin down below here, where there is this beautiful bronze fountain uh, of a putto with a dolphin that with a jet of water was creating a sort of choreography in the water. And uh, this is closer. The same scene that you can see it over here, we have the mask of Neptune, the mythological god of the ocean here represented. I'd like to focus your attention, ladies and gentlemen, on the single tessera that you can see. You need to be a very good artist to make a mosaic. It's very difficult to obtain the tridimensionality of a figure when you make a mosaic. Okay, so so many pieces of different color creating the eyes, the mouth, and the single aspect from the anatomical point of view of a figure. This is still actually the same today, because if you think that uh, the 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 screen of uh, of the video that you have it now is made of small pixel and the single pixel that we have today that we don't see because we are too small forming a figure they actually are the tessere of a mosaic of the roman time is the same principle anyhow okay so we have a closer view of these mosaics but i like to show you more painting this is a fantastic painting painting still there, found in the house of, of uh, the orchard, where here we have a lot of uh, symbols of the Jewish tradition. You have to know that we had the large immigration of Jewish people during the third century BC, soon after that the Judea land was conquered by Alexander the Great. There are a lot of people of uh, that culture living in Pompeii. We even found here painted, as you can see, the judgment of Solomon. You see Solomon itself here. And another great aspect, this was very magic. This mosaic is in the Archaeological Museum of Naples, was this lady over here. Sorry. This is an intriguing portrait because when you look at this face, pay attention, please. There is something wrong on this face. Have you noticed it? Well, I have divided, I've split this mosaic, this portrait, as you can see it down below. You know why? Because the idea of the artist was to represent this portrait lady in, your, young, in her young age on the right and in her elder age on the left, on the same mosaic portrait. Today, it is possible to do something like this only with the Photoshop. And this is another recent discovery of Pompeii. It's uh, the mythological scene called uh, Leda and the Swan. You have to know that Zeus, the chief of the deities, okay, he could make himself invisible and he could take any shape he wanted to. So he conquered Leda under the aspect of a swan. So we found this beautiful fresco in Pompeii a couple of years ago only, okay, where we can see Leda, this beautiful lady sitting, and Zeus under the aspect of a swan copulating with her. And then, ladies and gentlemen, here we have another great mosaic that was found in Pompeii. This is the largest mosaic, was found on the floor of the house of the dancing form, showing us the war in between Darius III, the king of the Persian. So we have the Persian army on the right, and we have here Alexander the Great, the king of Macedonia. This is the battle of Gogomela, 329. BC. The historians, they have redated this mosaic. Once it was called the Battle of Issa 333, 
today has been renamed as the Battle of Gogomela 329. Gogomela is a city near Mosul in Iraq. Anyhow, we can see Alexander the Great and Darius III here on the right hand side. Very interesting mosaic that is now in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. I'll let you imagine the work that they have done to take this, this mosaic made of over one and a half million pieces of marble. They had to cut it in square section and reassemble it in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. It was really a tremendous task. Beside the mosaic that you can see it over here, we have on the right hand side a, a report to the picture of the loaded dice I was talking about before. Here on the right, as you can see, that one of the dice loaded, and another picture that was found within a gambling room in Pompeii of the people gambling here on the right. Another interesting finding of Pompeii were for general surgery. Look how interesting are these instruments that you can see over here. We can even see here a catheter for urology made of bronze. This is a catheter of 2,000 years ago. Sorry. These are pliers for dentists. Okay. These are for obstetricians. So uh, these were found in a wooden box in the house of the surgeon of Pompeii. And this one up here is a blue vase. It's a blue vase that was found in a tomb outside the city walls of Pompeii in a cemetery. They knew how to blow glass, these people. Once the blue vase was ready and solid, the container was covered with a white glassy paste once both layers were solid, they, start, they started to sculpt the figures on the white layer using the blue one as a background. And it's all about the vintage. What is it all about it? This is a, a cinerary urn, okay, for cremated body found in a tomb outside the city walls of Pompeii. Now, I want to show you something really incredible. Uh, the situation of Mount Vesuvius volcano today, ladies and gentlemen, look at this. We have the crater of Monte Somma, the original mountain of 6,000 feet that was blown away during the eruption of the 79. The crater of the Vesuvius volcano of one and a half kilometer of circumference here in the center. And over 2 million people living all around the volcano itself. Now, from the 79 AD until the last eruption in 1944, month of March, we had the last spectacular eruption, eruption of this crater, and the lava went down in this direction and destroyed the city of San Sebastiano, over 3,000 victims. Since then, Okay, people, they have ignored that the Vesuvius is dangerous and is an explosive volcano, and they keep building closer and closer to the crater. So it's really a hopeful destiny. Pompeii, it's here. Herculaneum, it's right here. So two different directions. Pompeii was buried first because all the volcanic ash from the height of 15 miles, the northwest breeze brought over the city, the volcanic material. So within a few minutes, this volcanic material started to bury Pompeii. Only when during the second phase, we had a decreasing pressure from the magma chamber and the collapse of the volcanic jet from that height on the slopes of the volcano, creating surges of pyroclastic lava flow, only at that point from Herculaneum was buried down here, only four and a half 
um, only five kilometers far away, a few miles far away from the crater. So the temperature of the volcanic material, while in Pompeii, the temperature of volcanic material was in between 80 to 100 degrees Celsius. In Herculaneum, the temperature of volcanic material was 400 degrees Celsius. So it's a totally a different story that I hope to tell you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio. That was wonderful. And thanks to everyone who joined us. It's great to see that many of you are still with us. I know we're a little bit past the hour, but um, we've received so many great questions and comments in the chat. So um, I know Claudio wants to get to as many as possible right now. So if you're willing to stick around with us, we'll go through some of those. Um, so one that came in, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, there was a question about graffiti. Um, somebody suggested that there may be some graffiti on the remains at Pompeii that referred to a political campaign or some public messaging. Could you speak to that and perhaps what it was meant for? Um, that's an interesting question. Mostly of the graffiti, I have to say, uh, are from the electoral propaganda. Politicians, because you know, there was a group of people in charge of uh, painting the graffiti. Okay? Not everybody could go on the road because all the roads of Pompeii were plastered in white. And uh, so there was a lot of space for graffiti, to paint graffiti and uh, propaganda for the elections. No, no. Which one? Okay, no problem. So, and so I, <laughs> and, and uh, so we found this graffiti in Pompeii telling us a lot about, but mostly of the graffiti, as I was saying, were from political propaganda, okay? And uh, beside this, we have a lot of porno literature, recommendation, swearing and wounding against everybody in any languages. This is the point. Pompeii was a cosmopolitan place. You could find Egyptians in Pompeii, you could find Greek, okay? You could find people of any part of the Mediterranean Sea. We're talking about the first century AD. The entire Mediterranean Sea actually was under the Roman, the Roman, the Roman system, okay? So these people in Pompeii, where mostly of them were speaking Greek because the official language of the Mediterranean Sea during the first century AD was Greek. Okay, so in Pompeii, we found a lot of Greek inscription beside the Latin and all the other languages, including the Jewish language. So uh, these inscriptions were telling us about the life of Pompeii, the, polit the politicians that were in charge, what they were doing in certain buildings, who used to own certain places, and so on, okay? So th there are a lot of interesting, uh, interesting inscriptions. But I want to tell you one of somebody that uh, actually at the, the end of the day probably was there reading uh, these shocking inscriptions around the city. And at a certain point, he felt himself to leave a message too. And he started to talk to the world. He said, I am so sorry for you, world. And uh, I don't know how you can stand under the weight of so many nonsense. This is clearly, you know, somebody says, Mamma mia, this, is, this wall is supporting, actually is supporting all these stupid inscriptions, but at the same time, they were very productive as well. That's so great, thank you. We found, a, we found an incredible inscription that made a revolution in the history of Pompeii, Colleen. This inscription was written by somebody that uh, was restoring a wall in Pompeii, and even he wrote the date of when he was doing this. The date actually was October. And this was shocking because all the books are saying that Pompeii was buried the 24th of August. What this man was doing over there in October. And then they found a coin that was mint 
under Titus, during his 12th mandate, month of September, what this coin is doing in Pompeii if it was buried in August. So at the end, all the historians, they have agreed that Pompeii was not buried the 24th of August, but the 24th of October. So the inscriptions are helping us a lot, not only actually with the activities of Pompeii, but as well on redating certain events. Well, thank you for that. You just answered um, two questions at once because we had a lot of questions around the actual date as well. Um, we've had several questions come in around the, um, the, the politics of excavation and why several of the remains were moved to Naples versus being kept on site at Pompeii. For example, there's a brand new museum at Herculaneum that houses several of the remains from Herculaneum. And many of our guests are asking why the mosaics and art artifacts were moved to the Archaeological Museum in Naples versus being kept on site. And similar to that, um, many questions around the three quarters rate of excavation. Who is managing the process of archaeological excavation today? And what are the plans for completing the excavations? Yes. So the first question about uh, why all these findings were moved to the Archaeological Museum of Naples, the answer is very simple. Space. And you see, because probably not many people know that uh, the artifacts in between terracotta, coins, instruments, paintings, and uh, statues, decoration, mosaics, and so on, we're not talking about the 100 pieces or 1,000. We're talking about probably 100,000. Okay, so all these artifacts were brought in the Archaeological Museum of Naples for question of space. There is no space in Pompeii, okay, to exhibit, to show all these findings. And so they were brought in the Museum of Naples. Imagine that the Museum of Naples, as it is today, I give you only one number. Out of uh, 1,900 paintings brought away from the different cities, Roman cities of Oplontis, uh, Herculaneum, Pompeii, and Stabia, in this Museum of Naples, there are only 300 in exhibition. 1,600 of them are closed in the warehouses of the museum because there is no space, okay? But uh, if people are interested to have an idea of what there is in the Archaeological Museum of Naples, there is a fantastic uh, site in the internet. It's uh, a site that it's, uh, it's, I believe, that is um, in Wikipedia, okay? It's a catalog of the Archaeological Museum of Naples. And over there, there are the pictures of thousands and thousands and thousands of artifacts that were brought away from the digging to go to the Archaeological Museum of Naples. I mean, to have all the findings that we have of the archaeological sites in this region, in, in, in a museum, we should build another two museums, like the, the archaeological museum, that probably we have enough space to show to the people uh, all the artifacts that were found over here. That's why we are very happy when we go to United States and see in the Museum of Boston, you know, uh, statues from Pompeii and Herculaneum. When you go to Paul Getty Museum in Malibu and you see so many artifacts from the Roman world, we are happy because at least somebody can see them. Because here, I mean, they will be in the warehouses, nobody will ever see them. Probably you don't get the phenomenon. In this country, uh, we have 6,000 archaeological sites, 6,000. Oh. And only 213 are open to the visitors out of 6,000, we know where they are. The point is that, is this, the Italian government that 
is sponsoring all the excavation because the money is coming from the Italian government, okay, for the excavation of Pompeii and so on. And it, it's, it's, uh, uh, I, I want to say that uh, they have to take a decision at a certain point because unless you have money for the next 20 years, it's useless to bring to the light a place because you risk the second destruction. Because if you have money for the next 20 years to place people to look after this digging, to restore this place, it's useless to bring it to the light. They prefer to keep it buried until they have the economy to bring it to light. Then the digging is going very slow for a very simple reason, not only economic, but you know, during the, is it political? The, 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 the problem is political. The changes that we have in this area. Thinking are going very slow because, you know, you have to keep restoring and have specialized archaeologists for certain places. You cannot run. You risk to make a, a disaster while digging. So, uh, for instance, and then I, I conclude like this. In this area, we have, we have often earthquakes, okay? So that means that they have to start all over again in certain places. I remember the last earthquake in 1980. Pompeii was closed for over 10 days because they had to make safe and to inspect all the houses again and see if something is wrong because, you know, people uh, have to visit Pompeii uh, in safety. Um, we have, uh, thank you for that. That was really helpful um, and a good explanation of all the details involved in those difficult decisions. Um, we've had so many different questions too that I thought were somewhat fun. Um, guests have been asking about two very interesting finds. Um, perhaps you can address them separately. The first is uh, a guest wonders about a horse that was perhaps excavated, if that's true, and if there's any detail around that. And then the second is, is it true that the, some of the fruit trees which today grow around the site were grown from seeds excavated at the site of Pompeii? Or are those urban legends? A legend. As far as I know, I mean, uh, no trees were regenerated with the, the seeds of 2000 years ago. Okay, well, we could be helpful. And the horse, but, uh, perhaps? But, uh, but uh, the people that are specialized in this science, they have identified the type of tree. So often, according to the roots, they have uh, actually found out which kind of tree there was in that garden, so they have replanted the same tree in the same place, but not with the seeds of 2,000 years ago. In, if there was something that the Romans were proud of, then this was the garden. They had uh, this great hobby of uh, a, a conversation with their friends while walking in the garden. Okay, but concerning the the the. The skeleton of the horses, yes, recently was found uh, uh, the harnessed uh, horse, uh, but this was uh, uh, not in the city of Pompeii, it was on the suburb of Pompeii. Actually, there were three different skeletons of horses. So, uh, not that really far away, but on the border of the city of Pompeii. Uh, um, it was a great discovery, okay? But within the city walls of Pompeii, concerned animals, we found uh, beside the dog as well, uh, mules, skeletons, okay? So not only horses. Um, one other question that has just come in, what is the percentage of people who were perhaps able to flee? Do we have any record on how, what percentage of the population was able to okay. escape the eruption? I understand. Um, no records were found of how many people were living in Pompeii before the earthquake. The archaeologists uh, they said that not more than twenty thousand people could fit in the city because we know more or less how many houses, how many bedrooms, 
uh, there, there are in the city of Pompeii, even though one fourth of the city is still buried, more or less we know how many actually people were living out there. After the earthquake of the 62, as I said, 50% of the people fled the region and uh, the population of Pompeii reduced down to 10,000, 9,000 people only. While these nine, 10,000 people were living, were living in Pompeii, we had the eruption in 79 AD. According to the number of skeletons found up to now in Pompeii, we can clearly say that the number of victims in Pompeii were no more than 3,000. Hmm. So it means that at least 6,000 people could save their life running away in a different direction. Um, a few questions around um, agriculture. Uh, some people are wondering if wine was produced in Pompeii and how we might know that. Yes, we found a lot of uh, wine farms around Pompeii, starting from Trecase down to Terzinio, Octavian, and all the, the villages around the city of Pompeii, uh, we found still the Roman farms that are still there, the wine cellars are still there, the wine containers are still there. So the wine, of course, is not there anymore because it evaporated after absorbed by the terracotta containers. So the wine is not there anymore. But we have the most interesting uh, production of wine, of which the most famous one and expensive too was the Falernum. So if you ever find a bottle of Falernum wine, it comes from the Roman time. Besides the production of wine that was exported everywhere from the area of the Bay of Naples, we had the great production of olive oil. And uh, another product exported from Pompeii was the garum. The garum, it's, uh, it's made of the entrails of bluefish fermentated at the open air for months. Then after they used to add olive oil, vinegar, and spices. It's very similar to the Worcester sauce. At least nine ingredients of the Worcester sauce were in the Roman garum. That's and this made the, fortune, made the fortune of many, many, many people, this sauce, produced in Pompeii. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more. We'll try to wrap um, at the half past the hour. We still do have half of our participants online with us. So thank you for those of you who have stayed on. Um, there were, speaking of deterioration of wine, a lot of people are asking about the deterioration of the site itself and especially of the paintings. Um, a few people have compared their trips to China to see the Xi'an terracotta warriors and how those warriors were painted and asked about the frescoes in Italy. So why have the colors or why did the colors preserve so well as they did? Um, and has the site deteriorated at all after being excavated as is exposed to the oxygen today? Yes, the Pompeii was buried by hot volcanic material, mainly ashes, as I said, and cinders, general volcanic material. So these walls have been in contact with hot material. So the colors that we see in Pompeii, they are not the colors of 2000 years ago. They are darker. The yellow is darker, the red is darker. That's why the red, Pompeian red is so unique, okay? Because to have the same red of Pompeii, you should paint something red, put the volcanic ash nearby for 2000 years and probably you have the same result, okay? The colors of the uh, painting of Pompeii are minerals, <laughs> are minerals, you know, cinnabar, for instance, okay, or metal rust, the iron rust red, the bronze rust, okay, the white is from a kaolin white mineral that stands high temperature, the black is carbonized material, so they used to prepare the plaster first, 
The last layer was a watery solution of chalk hot wax. Hmm. And then they used to add, you cannot actually melt the hot wax only with the water solution of chalk. So what they were adding was potassium ashes. The chemical reaction made these two ingredients melt. So the last layer on the painting was this actually mixture. That's why the paintings of Pompeii are shining because of the wax. Same time was waterproof as well. But when it's a fresco, you have to be very fast to paint. It only, you have only a couple of hours until you can paint, until the, actually the paint can be absorbed by the plaster itself. Okay. That's why in Pompeii we have more uh, likely a demi-fresco and not the 100% fresco. Then to avoid infiltration of humidity in the plaster of the walls, underneath on the floor, there was a layer of lead to avoid infiltration of humidity in the plaster of the wall and kept the painting okay, for so long. So no colors of, in Pompeii are the original colors of 2000 years ago. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, one by final... the way, by, no, I want to complete, excuse me, by the way, I just uh, uh, in Pompeii recently was found um, a wall and the, down on the floor still all the containers of the different colors. So we gave you this information, not, just, not because we have read it in a book, but because we have seen the painting that are now in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. Another uh, answer that I want to add to the museum, in the last uh, 10 years, in Pompeii and in Herculaneum, we have as well museums. Not that large as the Archaeological Museum of Naples, that important as the Archaeological Museum of Naples, but today we have a small museum as well in Pompeii and a small museum as well in Herculaneum. Speaking of Herculaneum, perhaps we could close today. Um, I, I don't, <laughs> I know that asking you this question might be opening the floodgates, given that you have uh, an equal level of knowledge on the site of Herculaneum. And I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because we may be having an upcoming talk on the subject of Herculaneum at Inside Talk in the future. But if we could close just by answering these questions, what are the significant differences between the sites of Herculaneum and Pompeii today? What do visitors see at the two sites? Um, and and how, how do they differ most significantly? Okay. The city of Pompeii was a commercial. You have to imagine Pompeii as a huge mold with hundreds of shops, no drainage, okay? A lot of foreigners, a lot of sailors, a lot of buyers, businessmen, a lot of entertainments, okay? So a lot of money going around the city. So quite dangerous place due to the traffic and the busy place itself. So it was a portual city, okay? With the, the port from the Bay of Naples and the port from the River Sarno. So a commercial busy place. Herculaneum, residential. Wealthy people, imagine that uh, the father-in-law of Caesar Augustus was living in Herculaneum. The city was clean, one fourth Pompeii, Pompeii 20,000 inhabitants, Herculaneum only 5,000. The Americans, they can see Herculaneum in the Malibu Polgetti Museum because Paul Getty Museum, it's a, an imitation, it's a replica, it's a copy of uh, one of the most beautiful Roman residents ever built in the Bay of Naples, the house of Calpurnio Piso. He was the father-in-law of Caesar Augustus and uh, he decorated the house with over 80 statues in bronze and in marble that are now in the Archaeological Museum of Naples. 
And uh, this great architecture, in the United States, you have a lot of uh, replica and copies of the ancient classic monument. Not only Folgetti Museum is the replica of the Villa Calpurio Piso, but uh, I believe that in Nashville, you have a copy of the Parthenon. There is a copy of the David of Michelangelo in Florida. In New York, there was Penn Station that was the copy of the Bats of Caracalla. So I would say that in Herculaneum, you can see a residential area, a place where wealthy people, not only in money, but as well in culture, were living. And that the city was buried in a different way. While Pompeii was buried by rain of volcanic ash, and all the roof of the house actually collapsed. In Herculaneum, we had the surges of pyroclastic flow at a very high temperature, okay, that they came down to the sea and rebounds in, the, in town in the high temperature. So the city was buried through the windows, through the doors, horizontally, not vertically, as in Pompeii. And it's, uh, it's uh, from certain aspect, Herculaneum is better preserved than Pompeii. Great. Well, I know many of our listeners um, are certainly eager to visit in person, and we very much look forward to the day when we can do so. Claudio, I just want to thank you again, Grazie Emile, for your time and your expertise. It was extremely inspiring, and thank you for all the beautiful images you shared with us. Um, again, to all of our listeners, thank you very, very much on behalf of all of us at Tau for taking time out of your afternoon to join us today. Um, we will be sharing this recording again on the blog, www.tauk.com backslash blog, the Tauker. We will also be sharing it in our newsletter, The Compass, in the upcoming weeks. If you have any last minute questions, feel free to jot them into the chat. We will respond to the questions via email to make sure you have your responses. And um, we wish you all a wonderful Labor Day weekend. Stay safe, stay well. Thanks again. Goodbye, everybody. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.